Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December edition of African Liberty Webinar. Uh, 2019 is almost gone, and um, I know a lot of us are preparing for the holidays. Uh, for many Africans, though, it's a year you know they will never forget. In fact, a lot of uh, people that I know um, wouldn't remember this year for the good things. Although it's, it's been a really kind year for many of us, but for many Africans, uh, it's, it's 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 not a good year. And it's been a year of um, unapologetic, brutal repression of dissidents and opposition figures across the continent. And unfortunately, many of my colleagues in the media and the civil society have suffered uh, unfathomable persecution from politicians and law enforcement agencies. Uh, so this is a personal um, discussion for me, as you know, I'm sure it is for some among our guests and audience. Uh, joining me today, Festus Ogun, a Nigerian attorney and human rights activist, Linda Kavuka, Africa Programs Manager at Students for Liberty. Uh, she's also an attorney. Um, from Kenya, South African activist and board member at the Free Market Foundation in South Africa, Unati Kwadza. And um, we should have had um, the founding president of Cameroon's leading think tank in capital policy, Dr. Dennis Ferretia, join us today, but unfortunately, he will not be able to join us. But we're also proud to have you know, everybody join us today and um, welcome everybody. This is a very sensitive discussion and um, I would like to start by, you know, helping many of us understand the precarity of the situation Africa is presently. And uh, before the start of this webinar, I was, you know, reading um, the 2019 uh, report by our friends at um, the Fraser Institute. It was a joint report by the Fraser Institute and the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, of course, you know, um, drafted by Tanya Ponick and Ian Vasquez. And um, I look at the rankings, the 2019 Human, Free, Human, right, Human Freedom Index, and uh, more than half of the countries in the least 20 are in Africa. You know, that's, I don't want to say that's shameful, but it's, it's, a, it's a somber reflection of the reality of Africa in the last 12 months. And um, I know um, Festus, Linda, and um, Unati, have, you know, you guys are, you're primarily based in the continent, on the continent rather, and you have, a, you know, first-hand experience of what is going on. And I can tell you that uh, one of the questions that I, I usually get asked whenever I go, you know, to, you know, gatherings of African, uh, Africans in the media or in academia, it's often about, you know, from, from non-Africans, it's often about what's going on in Nigeria, what's going on in Cameroon, in South Africa. Will anybody, I, let me just start with, you know, um, Festus, will you kindly help us understand the situation of human rights in your country, Festus? The situation of human rights in Nigeria is presently in utmost decay and disarray. I must say that we have over 40 court decisions that have been fragrantly disregarded. Court decisions based on those that have been unlawfully jailed, those that have been unlawfully detained. We have situations where the Nigerian police force infringe on the rights and liberty of the people without any form of apology. There is a level of impunity going on in Nigeria. In fact, it seems we are back to the old days of the Junta boys with the level of violation human rights is facing. Let me quickly say to you that in Nigeria, as we speak, human rights only exist in the books, in our constitution. The fundamental rights of the Nigerian people has been largely disregarded, has been grossly disrespected and completely overlooked by the Nigerian government. As we speak, everyone lives in fear. We have a case of a prominent journalist, politician, and a pro-democracy convener who is being detained in custody for simply calling for a better society. We have cases of someone, for, of a Nigerian journalist, Agba Jalingu, who was only criticizing the go a particular governor of his state, Professor Ben Ayade, 
is presently facing terrorism charges in the country. I can go on and on to point out a series of cases of people who are simply exercising their rights and now are wallowing under the clause of the leadership of the country. So simply, the situation in Nigeria is nothing to write home about. In fact, like people will always say that human rights is part and parcel of constitutional democracy. I must say that as we speak in Nigeria, as much as the fundamental right, human rights is part of our law, the law is no longer respected now. Everyone lives in fear. Everyone lives in the fight. We are, the situation is just totally terrible in Nigeria. And it is even on gross disrespect for the law of the land. Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the, 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 the news dominated the media, African media space in the last six months, I think is, is the arrest of um, the founder of the Sahara Report, Omar Edesho Warrior. Of course, he, he's uh, a, a former presidential candidate. And it's really, really appalling. We've seen reaction from uh, some, um, you know, um, diplomats here in America, and it's, it's really horrific because it paints a very, you know, gloomy image about human rights situation in your country. And you remember, President Buhari was, was highly spoken of by um, President Barack Obama and by President Donald Trump. So it's really, really important to see that happening in Nigeria. I want to go quickly to um, UNATI. Uh, as I said earlier on UNATI, you know, South Africa is largely, not, not as largely, was largely seen as uh, one of the, the custodians of, you know, human rights in, 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 in Africa. And, um, but, you know, you, you, you cannot erase the fact that South African governments or South African politicians have not um, been decisive in responding to the, the state, the state, the spate of, you know, xenophobic attacks uh, across the country in, in the last few years. And it's reached a boiling point in, in 2019, especially with the attacks on businesses owned by foreign nationals, most of whom were Nigerians, Zimbabweans, and, you know, some other Africans. And this paints a picture that, you know, the rainbow nation is, 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 is no, perhaps no more the, the hospitable nation we, we usually think it, 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 it was. So, Nati, what's really going on in South Africa? Why, why is a politician, why are they not really being, um, you know, up and running as regards to eradicating this xenophobic um, emblemish in, on, on South African hospitality record? Yeah, thank you. Um, I can't speak for government, but uh, as someone who's observing um, what is happening in the country, um, I can say that uh, the major problem when it comes to the xenophobic attacks, the reason why um, we tend to not to, 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 to really control the situation is that uh, there's usually lack uh, uh, of po there's usually lack of police, proper policing uh, in communities, and uh, there are various reasons for that. Um, one of the one of the reasons, uh, for instance, um, the government will say that there's not enough uh, money. Uh, to, to employ more police. And the other reason, obviously, is the fact that uh, police that we have are not properly trained, at least uh, as someone who, who is actually uh, observing the situation. So, um, and then you find situations where I feel that politicians and people who are of influence will say um, things that uh, incite violence against uh, people coming out from other, country, other African countries. And um, then it becomes uh, a major problem because these are people, these are leaders uh, that people look up to. And so I feel that if the, the, those, the same leaders that people look up to can say careless things like, um, I mean, recently when, I mean, the last wave of xenophobic uh, attacks, uh, we have, uh, at the time, he was still mayor of uh, Johannesburg, Herman Mashaba. He was one of those people who was really ruthless um, in, in the way that he spoke, in the way that um, he, he, he projected uh, the message about uh, foreign nationals. Um, I mean, there was uh, one time that he said that uh, they were bringing diseases uh, to Johannesburg or South Africa. And uh, that was quite um, alarming for a leader to say such things. 
And um, we also know that in South Africa, we also we struggle with uh, opportun economic opportunities for, for, for locals uh, because of the state of our um, economy. So uh, I feel then that uh, it's, it's a time that politicians should even be more careful of the things that they say. Because if you say to, to, to someone, a South African, that um, uh, someone coming from Zimbabwe, for instance, or Nigeria, or is a criminal uh, and they are increasing crime in the country, and yet there's no evidence to show that someone from Zimbabwe or another country is more, I mean, has more potential to be a criminal than someone who is born in South Africa, then, um, I mean, those, those are the situations that cause uh, uh, xenophobic attacks to increase and um, but luckily um, it's been a while now that things have been quiet and we are grateful for that um, yeah hmm. I, I, I uh, remember I, I used to um, um, hold um, Eman Mashaba in I regard as a matter of fact it was uh, I think it was back in 2017 I was I had an interview with uh, a media here in the US a media mm -hmm. outlet here in the U.S. and they asked me about, you know, can you point to any leading classical liberal political figures in Africa? And I, I was quick to mention Emma Mashaba, but I was disappointed about his, um, you know, comments or rhetoric as regards, you know, the the xenophobic attack. It's, it's, it really mm -hmm. means, you know, politics sometimes can consume your philosophical identity if you're not careful. But uh, I, 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 yeah, I will, you know, want to accrue a little bit of, you know, the 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 repression in the political space in South Africa to Perhaps, you know, the attitude of uh, the Zuma administration, as a matter of fact, I, you know when I agree with me that um, the Zuma administration was one of the most corrupt in recent South African history. And um, we've seen, you know, I think it was back in 2018 that South Africa said it was going to um, boycott the International Criminal Court, um, mm -hmm. you know, chiefly because, you know, um, Omar Bashir had visited the country a few years ago and ICC had requested that he be arrested, but Zuma did not arrest Bashir, and Bashir, you know, left for Sudan and, you know, other things. But, uh, Monati, do you think it is right for the South African government to, to disintegrate or to exit the International Criminal Court or to not honor uh, the International Criminal Court, considering the, the rate of human rights abuses we've seen in the country? Hmm. No, obviously, it's not... Um, it, it's not adv advisable that um, South Africa can stand back uh, when human rights uh, are abused in, 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 in countries, including South Africa, by the way, because um, I know uh, you said uh, when you were introducing uh, the topic that South Africa was, has been seen for a number of years as the beacon of hope in the African con continent as a, as a country that uh, our government was seen as a country that, because of the constitution that we have um, as, a, as a government that upholds uh, human rights. But um, unfortunately, there have been cases that even our government has been found wanting. Um, if you remember in, in 2012, when um, government, uh, when law enforcement officers and police uh, gunned down 34 minors um, in, in, um, in Marikana, uh, there was a, a strike at Lonmin, one of the private companies. And um, police, before the, 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 the incident of the massacre, they had uh, not been able to arrest the situation and control uh, the, the, the mining strikers. But uh, what happened on that, on that day showed uh, it was really a dark cloud um, for our country. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, that was 2012, even today, there has not been a single person who has been held to account. Um, of course, we had um, a commission of inquiry, and we, we have a number of those in the country, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, I see those as sometimes as just government's way of uh, pretending to care about uh, what had happened. And um, I mean, it's, it's a crime uh, and it's uh, unacceptable as far as I'm concerned, that um, no one was held to, to account uh, when, when minors were gunned down. And um, we have a number of, 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 of those cases in the country. Um, so, yes, the Zuma administration was corrupt. And, and um, uh, I, I know people will, will 
always put uh, Zuma because he was the president, of course. But um, I feel that uh, the bigger uh, question is is the fact that he was he was uh, encouraged by his party, political party, the ANC, and um, unfortunately, um, they didn't uh, hold him to account until it was the very last uh, moment. So. If uh, South Africa then decides to to step back and uh, decide that South Africa is no longer going to be part of the ICC, um, it's going to be it's going to be a shame because I mean, if governments if our, uh, our systems already cannot hold our governments to account, who then is going to do that uh, for the African people? Um, so and 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 people say that no, it's because uh, African leaders are the only ones who are being targeted. But let's look at uh, what are they, if you say they're being targeted, are those cases that are brought against them um, made up? Um, are they not, uh, are, are those not uh, human rights issues that were like uh, committed? So um, it, will, it will be a shame, as I said, if South Africa decided that we are no longer going to be part of the ICC. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, of course, I gotta you know say that I do not agree with many of the things the ICC does. Sometimes I believe every country has their, should maintain their own legal sovereignty. The ICC should only be a, should only be a a, a a legal consortium of countries willing to participate, based on you know recognition of the fact that those countries have their legal autonomy. So yeah, of course you're right. It would be really really uh, you know horrendous for South Africa to leave the ICC, but. Um, I want to go back to Linda a little bit. Um, I do not, just a caveat, I do not subscribe to the fact that, you know, people could be judged about based on their genealogy. But I'm going to subscribe for, for, for the next one minute. Uhuru Kenyatta is the son of uh, Mzi, um, Jomo Kenyatta. I respect Mzi a lot, but I don't respect Mzi for his oppressions. Of course, we know he perpetrated some of, some of the the most unbelievable human rights abuses during his regime in the 1960s. We still cannot exonerate him from the murder of Thomas Mboya or um, some other you know, political figures in Kenya in the 1960s. But Uhuru Kenyatta is not the president of Kenya. His late father was the first uh, president of Kenya. Both of them have you know, been accused of gross human rights abuses. And it was back in 2018 that um, <laughs> a, a human rights commission said that 2018 was the year of terror in, in Kenya, especially for the media. And uh, we've seen uh, a couple of media outlets closed down and journalists arrested, uh, you know, unlawfully. And it's, you know, it's really, really ugly. But Linda, you could be a journalist for a while. You're a lawyer, you're a journalist sometimes. And, you know, I'm sure you have some colleagues in the, in the media space. What will you say is the reason, if at all there is any, or the rationality for the Kenyan government to detain journalists is there a constitutional validity for that? You're an attorney, tell us. Or is there even a, a social, you know, you know, justification, customer justification for, you know, repression against the media? So, um, like I had said earlier, Kenya stands out as a hub of Eastern Africa. And this happened um, after independence, thanks to the founding father bordering from um, capitalist policies and the other countries borrowing from socialist policies. So because of that ideological choice, these countries ended up developing very differently with Kenya, you know, um, growing by far larger in terms of um, the size of the economy and the value compared to the, the neighbors in Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda. So Kenya usually has kind of... Um, positive kind of reputation in the international world, but it is politics that usually brings the true nature of our, our leaders who, in the end of the day, are all alike, like the African brothers around the continent. In 2018, we saw live TV shut down by the government, which was unbelievable. And why? And as I said earlier, this was because um, the opposition had pledged to host a swearing-in of uh, Raila Odinga. And some of these 
because this was um, something that was happening that would affect the country, um, media houses were definitely airing um, the occurrences around um, this swearing in. And before this, then we had those riots around the country, protests, and you know the government cracking down on people, the killings, you know the the, the um, violent searches of houses looking for people who are seen to be, you know, against the state. And it was like a very, very bad reaction by the government that time of handling the, um, anal uh, the um, judiciary annulling the election. So you see, this was something that has never, ever happened in the continent. And it, there was an attempt in, during our 2013 election and the court, you know, the opposition filed a petition against the election, but it was thrown out. But this second time, while it was expected that the um, state would be, the status would be the same, the court actually said there were anomalies and the election is then annulled. So it was a shocker for President Uhuru, you know, um, all politicians of the Jubilee Party. And now the way they reacted after was, very bad and sad that people who will protest peacefully will be attacked and targeted, that people will be searched in their houses. And so the Kenyan media was airing all of these occurrences. And because they were airing what is happening around the country, then the state now kind of marked everyone who was showing, you know, this um, happenings on ground because it was exposing the current situation on ground to the international world, which was threatening the status of and reputation of Kenya to the world. And obviously this is something that the government doesn't want because it would like to you know, keep the good, be in good books of the people. So you know, by airing all those protests and riots on ground, and also airing um, you know, the meetings of the opposition party and airing the swearing in, or threatening to air, the government decided to shut, there was a media shutdown in Kenya, like we have never, ever, ever experienced that. Maybe our parents who, and older generation who are around during the you know, post-colonial era, those times when there was an attempted coup in the 80s, may have probably witnessed or experienced such a thing. But for us, you know, who were born, you know, when there was a different kind of Kenya, seeing media being shut down because their uh, actions that are against the state was a very big shocker. And uh, also, um, there was a crackdown on uh, NGOs in the country. Now, Kenya is home to some of the largest refugee camps in Africa, the Dab camp in, in, the, no in the northern part of Kenya. We also have like the large, one of the largest slums in Eastern Central Africa, the Kibera slum. And because of this and other factors, and also being the home of the UN, um, UN agencies, Kenya has a lot of national governmental organizations around. Now, um, obviously, the, most of them were not happy with what was happening and there were papers being written. And the government then also started cracking down on NGOs. And those that had, they were saying, uh, they even drafted a law trying to crack down NGOs that had um, getting more than 15% of their income from foreign um, countries like they were being screened and all that. Some of the NGOs closed shop and left the country. So this, all of this was happening in 2018 around that, you know, political area. And after the second election, that looked like a sham. So, you know, we can't we can't say it. It appears that the media is kind of free. But you will see that there is no freedom in media when we have our elections because the true nature of the state and it, it comes out. And when people now come out to challenge and show that they want maybe something different and people oppose the status quo, we now see serious repression of, you know, the media by the state. Hmm. Absolutely. But Linda, isn't it kind of, you know, ironic that um, the main, perhaps one of the main challenges to um, Z, um, Jomo Kenyatta, was um, Odinga, Odinga Odinga, the father of Rela Odinga, who now is, of course, the primary challenger to Uhuru Kenyatta. So it's just like continuation of the old world between the fathers now, between the sons. But, you know, Kenya is a very fascinating political landscape. But I would like to go back to um, um, Festus Ogu in Nigeria. And Festus, uh, <laughs> this makes me laugh sometimes, but it's reality. Your country, my country, unfortunately, but proudly though, recently passed uh, was or discussing, you know, the 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 possibility of enacting a law that will criminalize 
the the you know promotion of what is you know could be regarded as hate speech or intolerant speech. Of course, we call it the hate speech bill. What is the reasoning behind a hate speech bill? This is 2019. This is not 1984. 2019, a government that has millions of people in poverty, the extreme poverty capital of the world, instead of discussing about ways to move their people out of poverty, they're discussing a speech view. What was the rationality behind this, Festus? Well, thank you. Ordinarily, uh, we should know by now that the Nigerian government is allergic to criticism. The Nigerian government of today does not understand what it means to be tolerant. Now, the, the bill was introduced in the House. And mind you, it was not just the hate speech bill. We also have the social media bill. And the federal government of Nigeria is toying with these repressive bills at a time when the fundamental rights of the people freedom of expression, the right to freedom of expression is greatly violated. Ordinarily, it must be stated clearly that Nigeria does not need another hate speech bill as we speak. We don't need any social media bill. We have numerous legislations providing for offenses relating to hate speech, we have numerous legislations relating to the regulation of social media and hate speech. But no, the federal government is looking for a way, the federal government of Nigeria is looking for a way to clamp down all dissenting voices in the country. And that is why it is introducing the hate speech bill, which is punishable by death. Whereas the Nigerian Senate said after the criticism, weighed on the speech bill by the Nigerian civil society space. The Senate said, look, they cannot make any law, enact any law that will ensure that looting, embezzlement, bribery and corruption will become death penalty. So what they are saying in essence is that if you criticize the government, you can be charged for hate speech, and due to the criminal criminal justice system that we have in Nigeria, you can be convicted and you get killed for pointing at error, pointing at obvious incompetence displayed by political leadership. Whereas someone that steals can just be charged for corruption, can be charged for corruption related offenses, money laundering and the like and we get big lawyers, top attorneys to defend. But basically, the hate speech bill is just another testament to the fact that the Nigerian government is waging a serious war at the media. And let me quickly say that the leadership of the country, heavily headed by General Mahamadou Buhari, as once did you just call him a general? Did you just call him a general? Yes, he's a general. <laughs> you don't, yes, that yes, man is a yes. democratically elected president. You call, okay, okay. You don't oh, want to be arrested, yes, though. You just was, call that man a was, general. Okay. <laughs> you see, look. Yes, you can call him a democratically elected uh, president, but we have to be very sincere with ourselves. Ours is not yet democratic society. Our electoral system is is flawed with fraud. The overall essence of the Nigerian democracy is far from the real definition of democracy. And that is why we see human rights abuses getting rise on a daily basis. Take for instance, I was in court about four, five weeks ago with my principal. You will not believe that people in Nigeria are being charged for being poor, are being charged for working, I, I've been charged for being jobless in Nigeria. They call it wandering. That you are wandering, you are walking on the street. Now, the magistrate asks, what for a living? I don't have a job. Now, the person will be remanded in prison. What is the offense of such a person? 
for not having a means of livelihood. Oh my God. Let me quickly say this, that under our constitution, by virtue of chapter four, we have the, we have the political rights, but where we have the social and economic rights under chapter two, they are not made justiciable, they are not enforceable. Whereas we have in other clients like India, where the right to life is interpreted to mean the right to livelihood. But in Nigeria, it is a crime to be poor, where the government has also been helpless. So you see, from criminalizing poverty without providing any alternative, down to criminalizing the expression of a decent voice, criminalizing the exercise of fundamental rights. You can see that ours is, a, ours is a very complex situation, and the joke is in virtually all of us. Absolutely, That's you're absolutely right, right. Festus. Mm -hmm. I, sorry, just got you. I, 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 uh, one of our um, colleagues uh, at African Liberty is also been uh, on ground for a while and monitoring the situation as regards the um, the, the, the hate speech and social media bill in Nigeria. Akiemi, I don't know if you you are available, but Akiemi, can you just tell us what's what's going on in your in your area? What, what do you know about this speech bill? I'm, I mean, do you is there any justification whatsoever for this? Okay, thank you very much. There can never be justification for brutality. The 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 hate speech bill. As has been something that has been long coming for for Nigeria. I don't know if you followed the last the previous election in Nigeria during the elections when they when they asked the General Buhari if what he would tell yeah, you guys. I'm not part of it though. If you are calling this man a general, <laughs> I don't want to be spe <laughs> spare my my next two years. In, okay, anyway, he's general. I won't wear that 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 uh, qualification. General Muhammad Buhari, let's go. So when they asked the driver Modubari what he would tell the, the, the person if, if he loses, what he, what he would tell the, the opposition, he said he's going to congratulate himself. This was even before this was even before the, the election was concluded. So this this is someone who has who has had it coming for a very long time. He has had it planned. It is it is it is something that he has been working on for a very long time. This is not the first time they were presenting the, the hate speech bill to the National Assembly. It was presented when Bukola Saraki during the 8th General Assembly, uh, during the 8th Assembly of under Bukola Saraki. And this bill was, was, was rejected on, on the grounds that it was an infringement on the rights of, of the citizens. Uh, but now we have a Senate president that was rubber stamped. It was, it was assigned, it was, it was selected. I mean, even the selection process of the, of the Senate president was, was, was very, very political. He had an opposition who was arrested, who was accused by EFCSK of, um, of embezzlement of public funds, and they went to court immediately. But the moment he, he stepped out from the race, the, the, the case was withdrawn, and this person was, the other person became the president of the Senate. So all of these things, it, it, it is just a, a drama series that has been rehearsed perfectly, and they keep throwing it to the Nigerian space, one episode at a time. So now we're at the episode where they get to arrest people, to, to deter others from trying to protest. Then they are introducing the social media and hate speech, hate speech bill face. And from here, who knows what next? They, they started joking with the, the possibility of having uh, a, a third term president, presidency tenure, a one term six year tenure. They just, they throw these episodes to Nigerians. And when Nigerians get emotional about it, uh, they, they try to see how they react and then they, they slam it. So basically, they are taking they are taking away the rights of Nigerians one episode at a time, and there's nothing Nigerians can do about it because there is no unity. Even poverty cannot unite Nigerians. It's 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 just really really sad for Nigeria. Well, isn't that ridiculous? Even you know people cannot be united um, with the the most common um, states. Poverty in Nigeria was it, it's so endemic and biting um uh so hard. People cannot even unite to criticize their own government. Anyways, um, as it is in Nigeria. Uh, so it is in, in South Africa. But um, it, this is a, a, a little bit of, you know, a difference from political repression, as we've seen in South Africa recently. I think I was uh, reading up a human rights report um, on South Africa, and I came across um, um, the fact that um, about 11,000 children living with disability in South Africa are not, uh, they are still on a wait list. They are like uh, on a standby. Um, for consideration into, you know, um, high schools. 
And um, of course, we do not you know, get to discuss about you know, people with disabilities across Africa, their basic rights in, you know, all the time. But you know, it's, 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 a, it's an important discussion in South Africa. Unati, what's going on? What's, what's happening with uh, you know, the recognition of the rights of you know, people living with disabilities in South Africa? Um, in South Africa, we'll tell you about our constitution and how great it is. But uh, when you get down to seeing like the, the proof that our constitution is 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 great. Um, you actually look at the way uh, people or children in in this case with disabilities struggle uh, to 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 find proper um, institutions and schools, uh, special schools where they uh, because uh, accessing uh, education is a right is a human right for all of us. Um, so whether it's children or adults uh, struggling to access jobs uh, because of their disabilities, um, you you then ask yourself how great then is our institute? I mean, is our, is our constitution when uh, people uh, who are vulnerable in society, as such as disabled people, how great then is our uh, constitution if they are not protected, if they are not taken care of in, in the sense that uh, if a parent has a disabled child, then they won't struggle uh, to, to, to find a school for them. Um, so you find that uh, what happens then is that uh, people with disabilities, most of them will continue to live on the fringes of society because um, we, we are not making our constitution uh, such a, a, a living and breathing document uh, that impacts positively on people's lives. Um, move, like, just taking that a, a step back and um, because I'm thinking now of other vulnerable groups uh, in society. I'm thinking of uh, people with mental um, illnesses. Um, we saw a couple of years ago how uh, government's brutality, I will call it brutality because uh, that's not how, that the way they treated uh, mentally challenged uh, people who were at uh, live SCTB. And I don't know if you are familiar with, uh, with, with the story. Uh, the way people were treated, we ended up seeing uh, about 144 uh, patients uh, dying because government uh, didn't care about their lives. Government uh, was careless uh, in how in how uh, they dealt uh, with them. At the time, they were telling us that, oh no, uh, we don't have enough, we don't have money, uh, enough money to continue to live uh, to pay for them while they are in private institutions. So we'll take them and some of them will return them to their families. And remember that these were people uh, who had been in those institutions, mentally um, institutions for a very uh, long time. So for government to come and say, oh, we'll return you back uh, to your family or we'll find you another NGO to take care of you. And yet uh, it was found out that even the NGOs, uh, some of those NGOs were not even registered so they were, the people who were running them were not qualified to take care of vulnerable people such as mentally challenged people. So our constitution can be great on paper, but if it doesn't impact positively on people's lives, then as far as I'm concerned, uh, it, it becomes a useless document um, that uh, keeps getting praised. And um, I will also tell you that uh, even with the life as a demand, uh situation, uh, deaths of 144 people, no one, uh, no offic government officials uh, were brought to book. And um, this is the South Africa that people say, oh, we have a progressive uh, constitution. Oh, this government, uh, a constitutional democracy at last. People will be, uh, human rights will be respected. But unfortunately, we don't see a lot of that happening. And um, as if uh, people can, can, can be killed, um, if people can die in such high numbers and no one ever, uh, uh, is brought to book, then, uh, I mean, what are we? Are we still a constitutional democracy? Are we still a human rights uh, respecting country? Um, so those questions uh, still live with us uh, as South Africans and um, as, as government continues to disappoint us. Wow, that's, that's really, really heartbreaking. And, and I know this, the, the situation of, you know, um, the, um, disregard of you know rights of people living with disabilities resonates across Africa. As a matter of fact, one of our um, fellows at African Liberty recently published an article about the situation of um, internally displaced persons among uh, whom you know are people living with disabilities in Nigeria. Uh, but um, I have a question um, from one of our um, audience here is um, one of our um, leaders 
a student for Liberty in Nigeria. His name is Dr. Famorio. And I'm going to have Linda ask, answer this question um, because, of course, she's a international law attorney. And Dr. wants to know why uh, is the misuse of power common and more easy in Africa than anywhere else in the world? Linda. I was actually um, typing my response to this. And um, if you've read some of the articles written by Professor George Ayite, and you see what happened immediately after the colonial masters left the continent. In the beginning, we saw people like Mugabe, like he was a visionary and someone that people followed and he appeared to actually have the people's interest at heart. And this is the same case all around Africa by um, the few individuals who benefited from education, you know, probably traveled abroad, those who attended the Lancaster House meeting to talk about freedom in Africa, came back home, and, you know, were the ones who took over power from the colonial masters. And something interesting happened. These people realized the power that the political seat gives you as an individual. Mm -hmm. And power now thanks to the colonial system. The power was moved from the people, people who are organized either in communities or you know, under a kingdom to the state, to a central unit, no longer in the people. And the person who was at the helm, who controlled this power, you know, becomes the all-powerful and you can do whatever you want. So they tested it probably. In the beginning, you start seeing um, land grabbing, probably started with land grabbing, nepotism, and, you know, the people didn't really fight it. And these instances kind of bathed the kind of leaders Africa has seen, some of the worst dictators, some who still are still leading, unfortunately, to date. So greed and, you know, the need to be the all-powerful so that you are able to make um, things happen or people play to your tune, kind of appear to be the reasons that you see Africa having the kind of leaders we have. And also, most importantly, we the people allow it. We don't really do much about it. Like in Kenya, for example, if you were to speak about the child, we, we, if you follow Kenyans on Twitter, we, call K, we are called KOT. You know, we speak so much, you would believe like, wow, Kenya has freedom of press, these people are knowledgeable, you know, they speak about their country. But when it comes to action on ground, where, you know, a long time activist John Boniface Monkey will tell you, when it comes to actually calling people on ground to do something, you will find the crowd to be very small. Kenyans, will, we, are, we have this thing, and I think it's common across the continent, where we, are, we get used to the status quo. We are used to it. I don't know if maybe probably it started with people trying to survive colonialism and it was brought down into generations. Like you have a difficult environment and you adapt. So you keep on adapting and hoping for the best. Africans turn to religion and keep praying and hoping. Now we pray for the best. But we fail to realize that it's not necessarily, in my opinion, that we have to be violent. But the moment we decide to come together and say enough is enough, people in Africa have the power to shut down governments. We can decide not to move, not to go to work. Imagine if people in Lagos only, Lagos, decided not to go to everyone, decided not to go anywhere. The country can't move. You will realize that the leaders are a very small group, but the people, the majority are the ones who have the power. I guess until we realize that and look into our suffering and you know, choose to take over matters into our own hands peacefully, then we will see change in Africa. But until then, a number of people are benefiting from the status quo. And if you hear what Kenyans now tell you and maybe probably around the continent that we are waiting for our time to eat, we are waiting to have our person in power so that we benefit. And in our own Kenyan case, this is what the first president did. When he came into power, the land that was owned, um, like the creme de la creme land in Kenya, Kenya is 80% dry. So you have about 20% that is very arable. And most of this land was, was even called the White Highlands. When President Kenyatta came, first Kenyatta came into power, he kind of give, gave this to his friends. So it, it started like that. So, and 
you know, the Odingas from their father, they also have a lot of wealth and their family, you'll find the brothers of Raila and sisters are in government or in other big organizations. So Kenyans now believe strongly that there cannot be any change. What you need is have your own people in power. That is when development will come directly down to you. But politicians and that political city itself is corrupting, it's evil, and people have actually now resigned to losing hope in Africa, I guess, in the continent, having better. And people are like, if no one cares about me, why should I care about my brother? So I'm just waiting for my time to eat. And you can tell that we have had a younger generation of leaders in Africa, in Kenya especially, we've had younger leaders and they've been even worse thieves than the old guys. Yes. So I guess that's my take on, on that question. Rightly said, rightly said. Even sometimes uh, the younger ones we advocate for to be the leaders in Africa have often you know, done you know, even far worse. But um, of course there are hope, a little glimmer of hope in you know, the election of you know, individuals like uh, Abiy Ahmed in Ethiopia. And hopefully the trend can continue and, you know, the selected young leaders can, you know, do better than they are. Uh, what do, what do I think they call this generation, the, the, the hippo generation? Maybe they can do more than, better than the hippo generation. But I would like to go back to um, Lagos, uh, to Festus. Uh, Festus, one of the um, dominant cases of human rights abuses in Nigeria in the last three years has been the, the brutal sheer disregard for constitutional uh, constitutionalism and shared disregard for common sensibility, if I can use that language, by the Nigerian Law Enforcement Agency. And I'm talking about this, the, what's it called, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, the SAS. And um, they've done so much horror, so much that um, even people here, you go to school, you, you go to the meetings in Johns Hopkins here in DC, and they're discussing about Africa, they're going to talk about science brutality. You go to other schools like Yale, they're talking about Africa, it's about sad brutality most of the times. So what's really going on? Why are these you know, law enforcement agents going, literally, literally going scot free without anybody bringing them to book? Is you know, police harassment you know, constitutional in Nigeria? If it is not, how can you know, the, the government effectively address it? Festus. Yes, thank you. Now, I think we have to, be very careful here. I have always known that political leadership affects social behavior. The attitude usually worn by leaders in a country will definitely affect sociologically the behavioral pattern of the people living in it. And that is a more reason why you see the level of impunity in Nigeria, the head is rotten. One does not expect the tail or the middle of the fish to be, to be well. The leadership of the country, President Muhammad Buhari, the People's General, <laughs> has continuously been violating the rights of the people. So, it uses the DSS, the Department of State Services. It uses the SAS, the Special anti robbery Squad. So when they perpetrate the, their evil, when the police, when the, the sergeant, the ordinary man on the desk, perpetrates evil, there's, yes, people will, there will be up on social media, people will shout, but since the political leadership of the country is also culpable of sheer disregard to the rule of law, those SAS men, SAS officials, violating the laws of the land, will continue to go scot-free with the crimes they've committed. And let me say that the, the justice system of Nigeria is actually criminal and evil. The, the system of the Nigerian political country is not enough to produce justice. And that is why you don't see justice in Nigeria. We have a total dictatorial setting. This democracy is not fitting at all. And 
We wouldn't blame, we wouldn't blame the rulers too much. If a Buhari goes to say the United States, he cannot, he cannot attempt to continue perpetrating this media evil because the system will not allow it. But the system left by the colonial master is a dictatorial system. The foundation of the country is dictatorial. It's not, it's not in any way related to democracy. So the SARS men are still enjoying the impunity in the land. And it appears that there is no end to this serious malady. And you ask me why? The reason is not perfect. We have just two reasons for this. One, it is only the people that can deliver themselves from this sad situation. Mm -hmm. But in a situation where the political leadership of the country has weaponized poverty, they've used poverty against the people. They've done it as a weapon against the Nigerian people. Apart from the weaponization of poverty, the Nigerian government has also weaponized ignorance. They've deliberately made people ignorant of their rights. They've deliberately made people ignorant of their responsibility. They've deliberately made people get ignorant about the meaning and essence of citizenship in a country. Hmm. So the, with the way the system is fashioned, you, 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 just, you just quickly agree with me that if care is not taken, the remarriage is, is going to continue. But I will always say mm -hmm. that there is an end to all dictatorial tendencies. It has never happened that a dictator will defeat the Nigerian people. People will unite. But the Nigerian government is relentlessly using all its efforts to clamp down all dissenting voices. And that is why we are, we've been relentlessly calling on the United Nations, international bodies, to weigh in. Because now, the president is the commander in chief of armed forces. The president is the inspector general of police, where the SAS that continuously brutalizes the Nigerian people is directly under the Nigerian presidency. So, in fact, I would say that the Nigerian president is the most powerful president in the whole world because there is too much concentration of power in that single body. In Nigeria, you can't dress the way you like on the streets. If you pierce your hair, if you, if you dress the way you like, let me just put it that way, dress the way you like, you'll be harassed by the Nigerian police force, and the Nigerian police will get away with it. Mm. So, you can see that the situation over here is critical. Absolutely. Because, yeah, like, absolutely. I, like, like I said earlier, sorry, sorry, like I said earlier, the attitude of the political leadership will definitely have direct effects on mm -hmm. social behavior. And that is why you see, you see a situation where the SAS men are lawless, the Nigerian police force are lawless, the army, they are lawless, the custom officer, they are lawless, an average civil servant, lawless, everyone, lawless. We are back to the obedient state of nature. <laughs> yes. hopefully not to the real obesian state of nature where everything is brutal short and nasty <laughs> but uh, I, I really hope that's not the case but you're absolutely spot on um first is um so i i think i i at some point experienced this uh you know law sense of lawlessness among the law enforcement how, how ironic that sound sense of lawlessness among the law enforcement agents is very very appalling but uh before we get to close i would like to um ask uh unati this question well, Unati, uh, we've seen a, a little, I don't want to say a little bit, a great deal of degradation of morality or, you know, value in the ANC over the years. And the ANC, is, I'm sorry, even if you are an ANC supporter, but that's the reality. Uh, the ANC is not the ANC of Mandela or Becky. This is the ANC of, uh, of, of Zuma and, you know, the other views. But um, we've seen a, a new organization or a new set, the economic freedom fighters, although I got some reservation against um, the EFF, but we've seen the EFF step into, you know, the, the fold or, you know, the position where we used to know the ANC to champion human freedom and human rights in South Africa. Would you say 
the ANC is now the real custodian of human rights advocacy in South Africa, or if, even if they're not, they are not, who is? Um, oh, goodness. Uh, just one thing, the EFF uh, will never champion um, human rights. Um, it, it just can't. If you, if you are a South African and you are following um, the way that they have chosen to, to deal, um, uh, I mean, they just, they, they just break rules. And um, the leader of the EFF um, is currently actually facing a um, very serious um at, at one point in one of their rallies he he discharged a firearm um in, in in the air even though he i would like to think that um he's also a member of parliament uh quite fam should be quite familiar with the laws of the land uh, you should have known that that was um against the law to to do such a thing um so um i don't know um uh, there's also uh, a, a, Something coming, a lot of uh, investigations coming from from uh, the media is that um, they have uh, about I think it was about two years ago uh, when uh, a, 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 a bank um, called UBS uh, was looted and uh, people's life savings were were stolen. Um, the, the the EFF leaders are, are being counted as one of those uh, who who were part in in the whole uh, bank heist, if, if I may call it that. So uh, definitely the EFF are not champions of human rights. Um, they are very far from that. Um, and um, what has ha I think what has happened, Linda mentioned it earlier when she said that uh, sometimes even the younger leaders that uh, we thought uh, maybe they will uh, make a difference if uh, they were chosen. Um, because people have actually, uh, uh, people are, are using their positions um, uh, in, in, in the ANC, for instance. Uh, to 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 because they know that how much they can benefit uh, from from getting these government positions because um, because of PE which is a policy of black supposed uh, black economic empowerment um, so it 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 ends up uh, being the same people who are in top ANC leadership who get uh, these tenders uh, for government uh, business and um, so uh, what happens is now I think. The people who are in the ANC are people uh, mostly um, who, 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 can ben who have seen that they can actually benefit from uh, joining the party. So if you talk about uh, Mandela or Walter Sisulu or only Batambo's ANC, um, we know for a fact that uh, that was the ANC then, but definitely not now. Um, just uh, before we close, I think there's one um, uh, bill that the government is actually proposing at the moment. They want to, 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 to have expropriation without compensation. They want the constitution of the country to be changed so that government is, gives itself power to, they can take your property and not compensate you for it. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, property rights are human rights. Um, if the government uh, can just come and grab uh, your land, your property, uh, and uh, and and because they, they they are going to have the power to do it if the constitution is is changed and I hope uh, we never get to that but that is what uh, currently uh, this ANC government is proposing and um, it's un unfortunate especially for black people who have been denied uh, rights to own land uh, I mean f from as way back as 1913 um, so it it seems like as as much as we are moving forward as a country. The, the, the current government is actually, is also taking us backwards because um, if uh, like in this democratic dispensation, uh, I finally thought that oh I will have a, I I now have a right to own land, but now the current government is saying actually um, we we want to give ourselves power to take your land if you want to, um, so that's unfortunately the the threat now as far as I'm concerned, to human rights that we are seeing uh, in the country. And I hope, and the EFF is part of that, they support that, they support uh, the fact that uh, actually all land should belong to the state and uh, people should be tenants of, of, of the state. And I think it's preposterous uh, what they are uh, proposing. So that's, uh, that's something to watch. And I'm sure in 2020, uh, we'll see a lot of action in parliament uh, for that. 
mm. and uh, hopefully someone will challenge them um, in the constitutional court uh, over this uh, if they actually change the constitution to 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 allow this. Hopefully, hopefully, and um, mm. hopefully, hope it's a, it's, a, it's an expensive thing to to count on, and especially when you have the EFF being a very populist party promoting yeah. you know ideal uh, you know ideas that could be easily you know by by you know uh, into by the by the masses you know you you will have to be hopeful uh yeah. in the fact that you know you you want somebody to you know actually dis dismiss the eff uh from what they are constituting to be the champion of human rights and freedom mm -hmm. in south africa but i want us to close with linda and uh, for, uh with a question from one of our um, fellows here at african liberty linda <laughs> <laughs> is there hope for Africa? Is there hope for the average African that has been oppressed by, first of all, by their own chiefs and you know kings during the the back in the days, indigenous societies, of course, you know, different society from now during colonialism, and now in the hands of um, you know their peers? Is there any hope for the African? Yeah, just to add on on something you said, it's like. African people have been betrayed by their own people right from the colonial time. That is, it was chiefs and kings who are selling uh, African people as slaves, who are now the Black Americans and in Europe. And after that, we saw um, this white colonial master being uh, uh, replaced by the African political leader, who is now um, eating up the African person. So is there really hope? for people who have such a history of repression, oppression, you know, discrimination. I believe there is, there is. And just the fact that we have, we really have um, a community of people who strongly believe in individual liberty and free markets right here in Africa. A thing that is considered, was maybe probably considered impossible at one point. I think the fact that we exist and we're having this conversation now proves that there is hope. Our growth is slow, and it will probably take a long time before many African countries hit rock bottom, at least uh, that point where people now snap. And um, unfortunately, I think for most, it will take a really long time, but um, there is definitely hope. Challenges on us, um, those of us who know better, to you know, try as much as possible and to be smart about it, obviously. Don't, if you're facing an environment that is oppressive, you know, be careful about how you speak, but don't forget um, what you're supposed to speak about. You know, let's continue to point out the issues. Let's continue to speak about them on social media, you know, in person, wherever we go. Let's continue to put ourselves out there, including going to events like UN hosted or African Union. And, you know, challenging the status quo. That's what I'm tr I've been trying to do, I know. And you will often find criticism and find that you're moving against the current. It's not so funny. But um, if you are serious about the change that you want to see and you want, and you believe like I do, that Africa really deserves to be, you know, among the best and we deserve a better living because this is our home and it's possible. Let's be the change that we want to see. And Linda, I hope when you're talking about Africans finally snapping, I hope it's not going to be snapping on Snapchat because uh, that's that's what a lot of our people do these days: snap on Snapchat and uh, expressing their feelings on Instagram rather than taking to the streets and protesting. But that's going to conclude it for this month's edition of African Liberty webinar. I deeply appreciate your time and fascinating points, uh, Linda from Kenya. Um, Linda from the world, she's, she's, <laughs> she's a big traveler. Uh, Unati, one of our you know, great supporters in South Africa. And um, the ever interesting Professor Sokun from Nigeria. And uh, my colleagues in African Liberty and everybody that tuned in to join us, I appreciate your time. And um, we will see you next, next year, not next month. And uh, happy on this to everybody. And please enjoy your time.